today's events. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Ray Seneger, uh, Regina, and Aaron, and they're going to go ahead and brief us on Operation Baby Lift. So, you know, if you have any questions, obviously they'll open up uh, afterwards, but please let's welcome them to the stage and big round of applause. And without further ado, thank you. Regina and Aaron and I have made this presentation at the same time. We did it one other time in San Antonio. Uh, this presentation is given all over the United States. I speak five or six times a year. She speaks separately. Sometimes we speak together. Sometimes we speak with the captain slash colonel trainer, who is the aircraft commander. And Aaron speaks a lot more than we do at different organizations and things. So, and today what we're going to do is give you a perspective on Operation Baby Lift from a flight crew member's perspective, aeromedical perspective, and a baby who was one year old at the time and doesn't remember much of that, but she's going to have you re-enlisted when she gets up to college. <laughs> and then we've got a couple of surprises for you today. Uh, let me set it up first on what Baby Lift is about. It started out as a routine mission of Travis Air Force Base, and I'll be using I've heard acronyms all morning here, so the Air Force has changed. I didn't know what you guys were talking about this morning. <laughs> so I will probably say things that you don't know what it is either because times are different then. But we left Travis, and the airplane had gone from Travis with a different crew to Warner Robins, Georgia, and picked up 17 105 howitzers to drop off in South Vietnam as the country was starting to fall. And it had come back to Travis, and uh, for a C-5, it was in pretty much ready to go status at uh, 81 pages of write-ups on it. But it was ready to go, basically. <laughs> it, ready to go. And uh, for some reason, we'll call it Airplane A. Well, Airplane B is on the ramp. There's like 10 or 12, 15 airplanes out there. And it needed, Airplane B needs a bell crank. And those days, we were doing a lot of cannibalizing of parts. So they come, for whatever reason, instead of going to all these other airplanes, they come to this airplane that's loaded and ready to go and take a bell crank off of airplane A, our airplane, move it over to airplane B, put the bell crank on, and that airplane launches. Then they go to airplane C and get a bell crank to bring back the airplane A. No one can explain why they did that. But they found out later that those parts are not interchangeable. That particular bell crank is not. You cannot do that. You can cannibalize that. But they, nobody knew it then. Then it wasn't time to re-rig the door. So we had a, a chief out there, we had a tech sergeant, and a civilian. And they were doing this work on the airplane, and it wasn't time to re-rig it. So the order came down from the headquarters, get the airplane ready to go, because we had a 16 hour, they had a 16 hour ground time on the airplane. Now we, we're being alerted to go. We need the airplane out. So instead of actual re-rigging of the door, which you're supposed to do, they were told to sign it, run it through manually and sign it off, and they did. And we know now that likely what happened was the bell crank was so many like, thousands or hundreds of thousands of an inch too short or whatever, and it didn't work, and they think they cracked the bell crank. So, run it through five little times, cracked the bell crank, cracked it, cracked it, cracked it. Everything signed off and away we go. So we go to Honolulu, we go on a routine mission, I get off and flight examine the wing level. I jump off, I'm going to keep going on another airplane. I leave that crew. And I wind up going into Guam, a lot of crew resting there. Then I went into the Philippines and crew rested, looking for my Christian Science reading room to check out over there. And uh, I'd been sitting there a couple of days and they showed up. That's true. Yeah, you know that. Uh, so I was going to go to Yakota and go home. Well, two of the loadmasters actually got killed on this crash, came by my trailer and knocked on the door and said, why don't you come and go with us? And I said, nah, I don't need to go. I've already told you guys, give them a check rabbit, et cetera. So I decided not to go. Well, they go on down to the ramp to go fly. 
Then they find out there's going to be a test of the infrared countermeasure back in the days when they were developing this. So they came back to the trailer again and got me and said, you need to come with us because we're going to check this out. So I decided to go. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been on the flight. So we go to the ramp. And it's kind of late. Nobody else, is, medical crews are not alerted at that time. I've probably been there 30, 40 minutes. And I think every full colonel and pack out was on the ramp with staff car. And we did not have any clue what was going on. So it turns out they were briefing the aircraft commander that we had this mission coming up, but we need to do this, we need to do that. I'm not involved in that conversation at all. And finally, aircraft commander, Captain Trainer, comes around and says, anybody in here have combat loading experience? And you know you never volunteer. <laughs> I knew, you know, one thirty, a lot of experience on bodies and bags and wounded, et cetera. So he said, come with me. So we wound up going in for a briefing. Now, unbeknownst to me, and Dan, can we run that first slide of that video? In San Diego, President Ford was talking on April the 3rd. This happened on April 4th. Go ahead. Oh, back up here. Try to run the video. I have directed that money from a $2 million special foreign aid children's fund be made available to fly 2,000 South Vietnamese orphans to the United States as soon as possible. I have directed that C-5A aircraft and other aircraft specially equipped to care for these orphans during the flights be sent to Saigon. I expect these flights to begin within the next 36 to 48 hours. Thank you, sir. That's it. Hold up on it. Okay, now we didn't know any of this. I mean, I was going in for a briefing, had no idea what I was going to get briefed on. And uh, President Ford had made this speech on the 3rd. Now it's the 4th in Vietnam at this time. And it's early in the morning on the 4th. And uh, so I go in and they, they gather a bunch of people in and start briefing us and said, we're going to be evacuating people out of Vietnam. How many people can you floor load in the C-5 and put in the troop department and get them out safely? So my first question is, what are we taking? Is it Americans? Is it Vietnamese adults? Is it babies? What is it? We don't know. Come up with a figure. So I started trying to figure it out, and I figured if we could just carry babies, I'm trying to figure out, strap them onto the floor, et cetera, I could probably put 2,000 on there, put them in the troop compartment, and two pins down in the cargo compartment, and tie them down. If I was calling uh, mixed Vietnamese and babies, Vietnamese adults, and maybe some Americans, maybe uh, 1,500. If I was Amer Americans only, 1,000 was the number I came up with. So that, that number got debated around, and of course that's, that's a way, you know, I didn't really know. Finally, the aircraft commander, Captain Granny said, I'll tell you what the number is, it's 1,200. We reached 1,200 bodies on this airplane, we quit. We're done, no matter who it is. So that's the number that we left to go with. Now, we got delayed, out of Clark because they had to replace the windshield and had tried to cure it. We needed some time for that. So we had some delays and things going back and forth. Now in the meantime, Colonel Lowney can tell you, she was the first lieutenant then, she can tell you what was going on with her and how that all came about, how the medical crew wound up on the airplane with us. Okay, I need to give you a little background about where Arabac was at that time because Vietnam and the world was in chaos and so was Arabac. I was actually assigned to Travis Air Force Base. We had the 10th Air Medical Evacuation Squadron. We were what they called a tri-qualified squadron, which meant we could fly 130s, 141s, and C9s. Airbag's completely different today. Back then, you flew whatever your squadron flew, and you didn't get your final flight qualification until you got to your squadron. So you got your basic at flight school, and then you went to your squadron. The 9th crew was actually <coughs> stationed at Clark. They were C9 qualified only, and I don't know, some of you probably know really what the C9 looked like. It was specially designed for air medical evacuation. And so it had its own crews, it had its own med crews. It, it was constantly available to the squadrons that had that plane. Not like Travis, which we had to go scurry for planes sometimes when we had an air, air evac mission because we could take a 130, we could take a 141, or a C9 if one was available, and we were able to fly all of them. Late 74, this is a couple months before the mission, 
Air Force decided that all of Arabic was going to be consolidated under MAC, Military Airlift Command. So that meant the ninth group was no longer going to be a pac half asset, it was going to be a MAC asset. Um, same with the other squadron. So the commands were a little unhappy that they were going to lose all their, their uh, Arabic component. In the meantime, we all had to be upgraded to flight instructors because since we were tri-qualified, the unit at McGuire and the unit at Travis were the only two tri-qualified airbag units. We all had to be able to teach all the others. We were going to have to teach them how to fly the missions on the 141 and the C-130s. Okay, so I'm going over the Sunday before April 4th, then heading over on a 141. My, the, the plan was that I would stay there a month with the crew that was going with the med crew that was going with me, um, and we would fly the C9 missions, pull alerts for 141 aerobag missions, and do whatever else had to be done. So we were going to be doing all of that. So when we got to Clark on the Tuesday before this happened, um, the chief nurse of the night said. Okay, I've laid out your flying schedule. So I was supposed to pull 141 alert from Thursday the 3rd to Friday morning the 4th. And then that weekend, I was supposed to do a three day C9 trip to Thailand, Korea, Japan, one of their regular missions. So the nurse that went from my squad, Mary, who was killed in the crash, was pulling alert the day before. And then the chief nurse said, but we may be flying some extra missions because there's been a request for um, availability of air medical evacuation crews to get people out. But that was all we knew. We didn't know about President Ford's message. We didn't know um, anything more than that. So Friday morning at six o'clock, I'm over in Chambers Hall, which was where all of us stayed, the officers stayed here because it was like the TDY and the permanent party hotel. <laughs> I got a call at six o'clock in the morning and it was our scheduler from the tent who was over there teaching the ninth group how to schedule 141 missions and 130 missions. He calls me and he said, okay, this is an alert call. Well, we got alerted all the time at Clark, so that didn't phase me. It's like, okay, 141 alert, probably going to Diego Garcia because that's where we went a lot of times. He said, but this is for everybody that's over there. He said, um, you need to go get everybody that's there, mostly 10 people in the, in the reserves, because the, the reserve unit at Travis, the reserve unit at McCord, and the reserve unit at, at Norton also flew with us, the reserve air evac units. So he said, go wake everybody up. The crew bus will be there in 15 minutes. OK? So it was there in 15 minutes. So we got on the bus and we went over to the ninth and we had to sign in. The ninth group was signing in over here and we were signing in over on the other side. And of course, you know, and nobody knows exactly what the mission is. It's hurry up and wait. So we sat down and had coffee, small talk. We hardly knew the people in the ninth because we didn't really interface with them at all until we had to start flying and teaching them how to fly 141 missions. So we really didn't know each other. So we were kind of getting acquainted under these circumstances. And uh, pretty soon the chief nurse comes in and she says, well, we're going to go into Saigon and bring some people out. And at that time, C9s were still doing a weekly flight into Saigon. So they didn't tell her what aircraft was going to be used. They just said, we're going to fly a mission at <coughs> the, the time they need to be at the flight line. And uh, she picked an all-night crew because the, she was figuring it was a C9. They were more familiar with flying C9s because they did it every day of the week. Um, so she picked the crew and then she left. She came back in about 20 minutes later and she said, okay, scrub that. She said, you are taking a C5 and she said, the MCD has to be a cargo qualified MCD. So she said, here's the new crew. So that's how I ended up on the mission because I wasn't originally on the first pick of the crew because she had picked the C9 course. So we all said, well, what's the mission? She said, I don't know what the mission is. Okay, what gear do we need to take? And we're taking a C5. 
None of us has a checklist for a C5. None of us have ever flown an airbag mission on a C5. And oh, by the way, all of the airbag crews had less than two years flying experience, except for some of the senior people on it. But all the nurses had less than two years flying experience, the most of med techs, except for two of us. So she said, just, just gather up whatever med gear you can find. So we went and got our med gear boxes, because we carried them around in big blue containers, and we got on the crew bus and went out to the plane. And so I'm thinking, okay, on the MCD, I'm a first lieutenant. I have exactly two years in the Air Force and less than a full year of flying, and I'm in charge of this from the medical perspective. Okay? So I walked up to the aircraft commander with my crew, and a med crew is two flight nurses and three med techs. And I said to Captain Trainer, I said, hello. And I said, hello, I'm Lieutenant Downey, and this is the med crew that's going to be on the plane. And I said, we normally give each other a briefing, because normally the aircraft commander gives the MCD a briefing, and the MCD briefs the aircraft commander on the patients, so that you know what kind of patients you have in the plane. And all, I, I, I still remember Bud looked at me and he said, well, hi, I'm Bud Trainer. He said, I'm the aircraft commander and I've never flown an airbag mission in my life. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I said, well, I said, if I knew what our patients were gonna be, I could tell you, but I can't give you most of my briefing because I don't know what we're doing in terms of who we're taking out of Saigon. So I said, but, but, None of us have ever flown on a, on a C-5, and we certainly don't have a checklist for a C-5, and we don't know what the capabilities are. So, on the way to Saigon, would you have some of your crew do a, a walk around and teach us where all the equipment is? I said, particularly safety and emergency equipment, so we know where it is and how things operate. So, that is what the med crew did on our flight over. We were up primarily in the troop compartment, we did walk down in the cargo compartment. And I don't remember who of the flight crew was doing the instructions, but it's like, okay, you memorize all this stuff so you know it if you need it. And how do you adapt the 141 checklist to a C5? Because there were certain procedures we do for medical emergencies. So I think you even had more information than we did, really. Well, this is to kind of set it up. We had the unknowing carrying the unqualified to help us out with the mission. <laughs> 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 but they get out there, and I don't, I'm not privy to that. The talk between her and Captain Trainer, we try to get everything ready. And I knew we were bringing people out, and I knew some of these were going to be babies. They were mixed race children that had to be gotten out of the country. I just didn't know how many. Of them. I didn't know what the whole gist of it was going to be. So I had asked for, put extra blankets on board, and I asked for some extra pillows. And I asked for some juice and milk in case we had little kids. So they wound up putting 500 little cans of juice on the airplane and 500 cartons of milk we put back in the troop compartment. Some of it was stowed behind the loadmaster seat in the closet and then up against the back of the seats there. And we left there and we, uh, well, to start off with, we kept getting delayed. And I thought it was because of the windshield, but the real delay was about they couldn't get 1,200 people ready to go with that, for us to go there. So they kept delaying us, delaying us. Well, Major General Gong at 22nd Air Force at that time, he had a good friend in the command post at Clark by the name of Lieutenant Colonel Willis. So they were good friends, real close friends. He called Willis and said, get your butt on that airplane and get that crew moving. Get to Saigon now. So Colonel Willis showed up for the flight and wound up getting killed in the plane crash, which General Gong never really forgave himself for. Something that he, you know, really wasn't his fault, but he felt guilty about it. Anyway, General Will or Colonel Willis got on with us and went over there. So we finally got airborne. We, we fly into Saigon on the ventral. Uh, Colonel Alley, or Lieutenant Alley, and, and myself, and uh, was it Marcy or Harry? Marcy. Marcy. Marcy works was in the back, another lieutenant. And Bill Parker, tech sergeant, who wound up getting killed in the crash, too. So we rode over to Saigon. We rode in the Loadmaster seats. They sat in the seats facing us over there. And basically, we didn't talk to each other. I'd never met any of these people until that day on the airplane. The nurses, we weren't talking to them or anything. I get to Saigon, I have never seen such a mess in my life. As we got on the ground there, uh, we were unloading the howitzers and we opened the doors again, which is probably cracking that bell cranking. And uh, 
get the howitzers off, and then everybody, and there's a Brigadier General there by the name of Vaughn, Richard Vaughn, he lives in San Antonio now. Uh, he was out there, he looked like he was about 21 years old, really young looking, one star general. And uh, he's kind of giving us direction on what to do, but so was everybody else on that tarmac out there. Everybody's trying to get their families on board, they're trying to get the kids on board, they're trying to anything they could to hook and crook us to put him, he wanted everybody to get him out of it. So I was the chief load master, so I was kind of in charge, but I can figure out right I wasn't in charge of anything. It was just total chaos. Just trying to get him in, get them strapped to the floor, get people parading around. And Regina and I kind of traded off on different things. And one of the things we did was putting these children upstairs in the troop compartment. And you'll see pictures down in there. And we made a decision on who went upstairs between the two of us and who stayed downstairs. And our decision was if you were big enough to take care of yourself, like the bigger children you'll see in here, we put them on a the catwalk on both sides of the airplane, forward of the wheel well, and ran a tie down strap, and four or four is good, so strap, ran out and tied them to the wall, and then did it again. And then the rest of them put on the floor with blankets laid out and pillows and put adults. And there was defense attache wives down there, defense attache office wives, that General Vaughn was getting out of the country, uh, unbeknownst to Ambassador Graham, which cost General Vaughn his job, because uh, he slipped on the airplane. And General Vaughn gave me a manifest and said, here's the manifest. And I assumed I had the manifest for everybody on that airplane that said, I only had the manifest for those defense attache office wives. That's all I had. It was in my flight suit pocket with there's movies or there's video that day of me going in the hospital with that in my pocket. But anyway, I thought I had it all. Uh, Mother Gina talked about some of the other things she did. But anyway, we, we made decisions on who went upstairs and who didn't. And it was totally based on, are you big enough that we have something happen you can get out of the airplane? And then we had, I believe, three children. One was blind and a couple of them were on crutches that had polio, I guess. And we put them upstairs so they could take care of themselves. But other than that, we put everybody else downstairs. And in the troop compartment, there was 75 seats, 73 seats for passengers, two seats for load managers. And I, the only number I can give you that I know is on that airplane for a fact, other than the flight group, is I had 145 babies in 75 seats. No adult in the troop department had a seat. And they put them in a, two to a seat, six to a row on the three across, and put pillows over the front of them, and put, took the seat belts and hooked them together. And that's how we put those up there. And I can tell you that number is accurate. And out of those 145 babies up there, 144 of those babies survived the crash. One, one child died. So, kind of go into some of the things you were doing, Sag, on this. Yeah, yeah, well, after they unloaded the howitzers, um, Captain Trainer wanted the med crew to come up on the flight deck, and then some of the flight crew was up there. And I remember he went into the command post with the co pilot, and they came back, and there was a colonel with them, an Air Force colonel. And the Air Force Colonel said to the group of us on the flight deck, who's the medical crew director on this mission? I said, well, I am, sir. And he said, okay, well, this is your mission. You're going to take 300 babies out of, out of uh, Saigon today on this mission, and most of them are under the age of two. Okay, I was overwhelmed at Clark when I found out what I was going to be doing. You can imagine, as a first lieutenant, how I felt like, I've got 300 babies that I'm taking out, and they're under the age of two. How am I going to manage all of that when there's five medical crew members to take care of all these people? But as, as Ray said, we, we talked about how we were going to do it, and we really, um, we really did develop a system. It worked pretty well. Um, we had one of the load masters at the troop compartment door, and I stood at the bottom of the ladder, and then some of the flight crew it was an augmented flight crew. So some of the flight crew actually lined the stairwell that goes up to the troop compartment, and we hand over hand handed the babies. And I took each one that came in. I held them for a minute just to take a look at them to see how they were, and then handed them to the next person to put up there. And then I had had the rest of the med crew upstairs so they could put the, the babies in the seats and get everybody squared away up there. And then when Marcy said that they had no more room, then we knew we had to do everybody downstairs. So some of the babies did end up downstairs. 
So we spent the rest of the time on the ground getting ready to, to take off, and we had a lot of their medical records, and all the little babies had main tags around their, their um, necks, on little, like, lane. They had them on. Um, and one of the, she was, Margaret Moses was one of the Australians who was on the mission. Um, she was accompanying them because some of the babies came from the orphanages there in Saigon, because these were babies from all over the country. Um, she got very upset with me because she wanted to distribute all the records throughout the plane to the right babies, and then she wanted to store them someplace else. And I kept saying, we can't do that. That isn't how it's, you know, I was trying to explain to her. And Ray came to my rescue because he, he backed me up and said, no, we can't do it that way. And she was really mad at me because I wouldn't let her do it that way. I said, no, we can't do it that way. Uh, and a couple other things she wanted to do, the women and safety violations, and I said, we can't, we can't do that. And so um, once we got all that taken care of and we were ready to take off, I said to the med crew, I said, okay, there's two nurses, so one nurse is upstairs, one nurse is downstairs, and I kept two of the med techs downstairs and sent one upstairs. So it's like one nurse and one med tech. There were adults up, up in the troop compartment too, because we took some of the, the women that were accompanying the children and put them upstairs. At the very last minute, a 141 had come in after us, and they had a med crew on board, and they found out that they were not going to be taking any babies, any, I don't even think they took any people out. They took nothing. Yeah, so, so Mary contacted Clark and said, can we augment the med crew on the C5 because they've got all these babies. So at the very last minute, um, she came running up with the med crew and said, we're on many. And so I had to make sure Captain Trainer knew that we had five more medical crew members on board the plane. That gave us four nurses and six med techs. So since I'd already split my crew, I said, okay, I'm going to split your crew too. Well, Harriet was a ninth group nurse. So I said, she can go up in the troop compartment. Mary, you stay down here with me because you're cargo qualified. And then um, Mike Padgett stayed down there. And um, then I, I, I split it so there was one complete med crew downstairs and one complete med crew upstairs. Denny Johnson was that too. Yeah, and, yeah. So that's how we, took, we were when we took off. And, and actually, on takeoff, Mary and I were sitting with Colonel Willis on the catwalk across from where we had most of the, the children strapped to the, to the plane. When we took off, one of the women that was accompanying the, the children got violently ill. So Mike and Mary and I got up. Um, when you're an air vet crew, a lot of times you're up when you're not supposed to be up, but you got to take care of the patient. So we got up, went over to see what was wrong, um, and we decided to give her some medication. I had no idea what we decided or what it was. So I went upstairs because our med kids had narcotics, and so we wanted them stowed where they wouldn't, wouldn't be accessible to anybody but us. So we had them stowed up in the galley area. Back there with the low part. Yeah, because that way we figured there wouldn't be as much accessibility to them um, if we put them downstairs. So I was up there at the time of the RD, and I'll let Ray fill in some more. But yeah. that's, that's where we were. That was how we were at the time for Hey, Trank, let's do this first look. Here's the cargo compartment. Now, I've seen pictures of like C-17s who had loads in them in 130s, and I've done some 130 loads and you had, usually you had more time to put this together. This is hastily put together, and we've got to get out, we've got to get out of Saigon as fast as we can to. Plus, we've got to get these people in there. So there's the blankets on the floor. Those are the defense attache office whites in that picture. And some babies you'll see there on the floor because we ran out of room upstairs. And how many babies I had downstairs, I do not know. I, I made a count, I don't know how many times, of both places. I know exactly what I had upstairs. But downstairs, things kept changing. Adults were getting on, adults were getting off, but they weren't part of flight. Kids were moving around. My, uh, my official total, my number, when they asked me, it's in my accident report, is how many people we had on board. I counted flight crew, I knew was there, I counted what I knew up here, and I kind of estimated what I had downstairs. And my number was 331 people. Now the official count in the action report is 321. My number is not right, 321 is not right. Only God knows how many people on the airplane, for sure. So 
we got, got all that ready, and these are the people downstairs, and you'll see the kids along the catwalk strapped to the wall. There were the, over the tie-down devices, etc. Had the same thing on the other side. I can today, I still see these women's faces. It's amazing how that's ingrained in me. But anyway, we get this guy. Next slide. There's a kid strapped to the catwalk. Now you can see they're all mixed race children. This is what we're trying to get out of the country. Uh, Vietnamese mothers, American military fathers. Okay. Uh, next slide. There's the troop compartment. That's where I had 145 babies in 75 seats. And one child up there died, and she, like she said, they had a little, like a better, a little ditty bag around her neck with a safety pin to the shirt and a drawstring on it. And the, everything in that bag was a dollar, supposedly. I, I didn't look into one, but it was supposedly a dollar. And everything that child owned in life was in that bag. And uh, one of them, the safety pin pulled out during the accident, it choked that child to death. It's the only one that died of it. The rest of them, even though the seats broke and it tumbled, you see they're down so far in the seats, and when it comes, you and I would have killed. But they're so far down, it's like a cocoon, and there's the seats rolling around in the crash. Those children survived that. They were still strapped in. Some of them were even crying. I guess when got I wasn't back there. Virginia was there. Some of them were asleep. Yeah. <laughs> so, next slide. I'm not sure what the next one is here. That's an actual photo of us taking off from Saigon that day. That is 80218 with all 321 to 331 people on board, crew and everything. That picture was taken by an Associated Press photographer. And that's another thing. There was another problem we had that day. I think every news agency and TV station in the world was on that ramp knowing what we were getting ready to do and in our way. Just couldn't get rid of it. And, they, and that's a photo that the guy took it as we were leaving. Next slide. That's what it looked like 30 minutes later. We were 14 minutes out over the uh, South China Sea when the rapid decompression happened. And everyone in here, just about everyone in here has been through an altitude chamber. It's exactly how it happened through the altitude chamber. Just a loud, loud, loud bang. And everything comes off the wall. Insulation comes off. There's debris flying everywhere in the airplane. And obviously, you're in a state of shock when that happens because you weren't expecting that to happen. Uh, I'll explain a couple of things here that you can see, that you can see there. Don't back up. Here. See, there's the detail there. There. Oh. Back up. Get the microphone. Right there. Microphone. Right. Right. Get the microphone. I can't hear you. Okay. There. Right there. See, I'm an amateur at this. There's the this T-tail. There's the troop compartment Colonel Lowney was in, and 145 babies, and, and some other people, uh, including the person in this room today that went all the way to the crash site in, in that seat right there. And then here's the cockpit that some of us were in, and the wings burned up here. And this is where we're plowing through the, the rice paddy. Now, as this is happening at the takeoff, at the rapid decompression, and she said she had gone upstairs, and I'll let her tell you what she saw. She's, if you move to C5, there's an open grate you can look through back in the truth compartment. She had the narcotics on that, and she was taking the narcotics out of it when the rapid decompression happened. Now, a loadmaster, Howard Perkins, who's still, I suppose, if he's still living, he lives in the Travis area somewhere, he was coming up and had just reached through the gate to unlock the gate to go up in the truth compartment. And Perkins was senior master sergeant, weighed about 240, 250, big muscular guy. And Bill Parker was in the troop compartment. Uh, Bill probably weighed 165, 70 pounds, soaking wet, little muscular guy. And if you've ever seen the C5, the gate that's there to open up, as you reach through it, there's not much of an opening there. Well, Parker pulled this huge man through that door because the ladder broke off and went out, and he's dangling there with both his legs broken. And Parker was able to pull him, and I don't know how he got his arms up fried, because I wouldn't have released the gate and let him pull me in. But he pulled him up in there and saved his life. And then let you see what you were seeing. Okay. I was kneeling, I was putting the narcotic kit away, and as I said, it was behind the loadmaster seat in the galley area, and Sergeant Parker was right behind me. And he leaned over and said to me, do you need anything? And I said, no. 
And they just said no when we had the RV. Um, and as Ray said, if you've been through one in the altitude chamber, it happens exactly that way. So I knew, we all knew what it was, the crew knew what it was, but all the insulation was coming out. And we didn't have as much stuff lying around up there as badly as the, the cargo hold because we were a little, a little bit protected up there. Um, but so I'm leaning on that grate, closing up the narcotic kit, and I looked down and I saw the South China Sea. And I saw all the, the cables hanging like spaghetti in the back of the plane and all the hydraulic fluid all over. And one of our med kits that was back there, I still to this day don't know how it stayed there. They were big long med kits about this long, about that high, about that wide. It was teeter-tottering on the edge. It was just rocking back and forth, back and forth on the edge of the, the plane. And then it, to see the, the jagged edge of the plane. Um, as Ray said, Sergeant Perkins was and I turned and I saw him, and Sergeant Parker ran over to him, um, and I thought, we're trapped up here because we had no way to get downstairs, so I had no idea what was happening downstairs. Couldn't get to the flight deck, so I didn't know what was happening up there. So I said to the, the medic, I said, okay, I said, we all see we're in a bad way here. I said, we're going to have to figure out how to take care of everybody up here and how to prepare for a crash landing because we just knew that's what was going to happen. And I said, we'll, we'll have to hope that everybody downstairs and everybody on the flight deck is able to, to take care of what they need to take care of in that part because we had no way of getting anywhere else but that treatment. So that's what was going on too. And I didn't know any of that, but when she went to get the narcotics, I had gone to the flight deck and I thought, I'm gonna bring some jugs of water down here because we're gonna need some water down here with all these people, it's hot. And I went upstairs and I thought, I'll just take a drink before I go back down. So I poured me a cup and I went over and I sat down in front of the coat closet in the, seat, in the middle seat. And I had a navigator on my left, Major Wallace, on my right was the tech sergeant, P.D. Brad, Percy Bradley, love master. And they had made some small talk with me to say something. And I was, I was sweating, I was hot and aggravated. And I said, can you believe this day? What the hell else could go wrong? RD happened at that moment. Oxygen mass fell just like they're supposed to. First thing I did, because I didn't know what altitude we were at. We were 23,800 feet of the rapid decompression. I grabbed the oxygen mass, pulled on it, wound up pulling it out of the ceiling because it wouldn't work. I couldn't get any oxygen into it. None of the masks worked back in the relief group department at all. I jumped up and grabbed a walk around bottle in front of me before anybody else got to it. Get my bottle, didn't need it, but I thought it did. And uh, in the meantime, you know, Captain Trainer is screaming from the cockpit for me to get up there. So I go around up there and he said, survey downstairs. What the hell happened? Go down and check, see what's going on. So I remember uh, the door was gone to the flight deck upstairs. The bowling door had been sucked out of the airplane. It went downstairs and hit Sergeant Patch and she started doing that and basically cut the front of his face off. Captain Mary Klinker was working on him, Colonel Willis was working on him, and Phil Wise, another medic, were all working on him when I went down the ladder. But I went halfway down the ladder and I looked to the back of the airplane and she just stole my line there a little bit. I, I'm looking back and I thought, damn, that looks like spaghetti back there. All these control cables are dangling and this red hydraulic fluid is pumping out. And we had cut two hydraulic, we lost two hydraulic systems because it cut the cables and it cut the, the hose of the lines to the hydraulics. Uh, they went down the center of the airplane in those days. After this accident, all that stuff was moved to the outer edges because the pressure door went out, went up and, and, and cut all that stuff off away from the airplane. So I'm looking at that and, I, and we're going down. We went into a left bank, going down, and the only thing going through my mind, if I could just put my feet on the ground right now, I'd be okay. And probably I said that in my mind 100, 200 times, knowing it wasn't going to come true, but I kept wanting it to happen. And I'm crawling among those people you saw on that floor, babies and all. And uh, I'm crawling uphill, actually, because we're going down. And I'm trying to get to the back of the airplane. And uh, as I'm crawling through there, I'm going past some straps, and some woman is screaming at me that my baby is gone. I'm thinking, that's not possible. And I look down, there's nobody under the strap. So I'm figuring, the baby's probably gone because there used to be somebody there apparently. 
So I kind of reassure her the baby was not gone, that didn't know. Uh, I kept crawling the back of the airplane and there's a video out that General, uh, National Geographic did on us back in 2006 or seven. And uh, you can pull that up on YouTube sometimes. Sometimes you can get it, sometimes you can But anyway, the movie portrays me standing on the edge of the ramp. Well, that's not true, because the ramp, edge of the ramp wasn't there. The edge of the ramp was cut off right behind the windswell that she was looking down. She's looking at the ocean, she sees the jet at the edge of it. So I get back there, by the time I get crawled to the back of the airplane, we kind of leveled out at that point, so I could stand up again. And I decided to walk back to the front. I'm gonna go upstairs and talk to uh, Captain Trainer about what I was observing back there. And uh, in the movie, the video they show, it shows me on a telephone on the wall by the loadmaster station right there, which we know that's not true. And I actually went back up to the cockpit to, to tell him about it. And I explained what I'd seen down there and you know, what they're trying to fly the damn airplane at this particular point. Now, I'm not, hey, I'm not on headset. I don't really know what's going on. But we were porpoising like this. And I'm trying to figure out what the hell are they doing? When I, I go back downstairs, I, I really can figure it out. And actually, they have two young captains experimenting with how to get this airplane to fly and stay in the air. And they've had psychiatrists tell down on us again and again, you were lucky you had a couple of kids up there. If you'd had some old lieutenant colonels, or majors had been doing this a long time, they'd have tried an emergency procedure and it didn't work, what would they do? Do it again and again and again. And none of that's working. These guys are making it up. They tried something that didn't work. They tried something else. They're actually flying on four engines and ailerons. That's all they had. Two hydraulic systems gone, a lot of the control cables gone. So we were 14 miles out of the South China Sea at that time, and the door went out. And they turned the airplane around. They got the damn airplane turned around some way, 14 miles over the sea, and started back towards Saigon. And then that was porpoising. Well, as it turns out, they were flying the airplane, well, it was climbing too good, they pulled power back, stall it out, and go down. So we were oscillating 5,000 feet at the time. I, I knew it was bad, but I didn't, I didn't realize 5,000 feet. And that's the way they were doing it. We were doing really good until we put the gear down like we're supposed to on the checklist. And then it was too late. It was, it was gone, man. And it kept it. And it went one of those power things when this happened. And we were trying to turn toward the runway. And, uh, and I was not on headset, so I don't know. In the meantime, I decided I'm going to go downstairs. And when this plane gets back, I'm going to have to help get these people out. So I go ask downstairs, well, pretty soon this uh, Tech Sergeant Bradley comes down, he said, hey, Ray, we need to go get our crash landing checklist, you know, because we're probably gonna crash. And I thought, that's a pretty good idea. So I went upstairs, I stored, I had everybody store their bags in the, in the forward bunker, and I found my briefcase, and I opened it, I grabbed my checklist, I started coming through it. And here, I'm a 60th wing, I'm a standardization guy here, okay? I'm thumbing through my checklist, and I thought, well, there's no such thing as a crash landing checklist. I remember throwing it into the floor and <laughs> bump up there. Then I decided I'm going to go back downstairs. But when I started to go downstairs, Master Sergeant McAtee, flight engineer, that wasn't on the panel, he's back in the relief department, and he starts cussing at me and telling me to get in the seat, you know, do this and do that. I'm seeing a Master Sergeant, he's a Master Sergeant, and I'm thinking, I'm working, you're sitting on your butt, I should go back and have a PC. So I started to go back and I thought, nah, nah, so I, I started down the ladder again. Well, he lit into me again. As I started down the ladder, the tech sergeant angles on the panel grabbed me by the back of my flight suit and jerks me back on the flight deck. Now McAtee's barking at me again. So I go back to have a piece of him. So when I get back there, he's sitting down. He probably weighs about 250. I weighed about 185 then. He reaches out, grabs me by my left elbow, lifts me off the floor, and throws me into the seat at the table. And I ricochet around on the table, or in the seat there, and I can hear the ground coming in. We were doing, at that point, we were doing uh, 280 knots when we hit the ground the first time. And uh, still accelerating. And uh, I didn't know any of that at the point. So I hear the ground coming up, and I know we're getting close. So I reached down to get my seat belt. Did you ever get on a commercial airliner and try to find your seat belt? You know, you're fumbling around. Well, it was perfect. I found it. I snapped it. About a foot and a half in front of me, it snapped. And when that snapped, we hit the ground. 280 knots, still accelerated for the first time. And the airplane started at that point, was still intact, everything was still in real time, the lights were on, all that good stuff. And I'm looking out the window and I could see out the porthole 
all at once there's water underneath me. I don't know. We must have landed a little short. He's just bouncing this thing up to get it back to the runway. I didn't know we were long ways from the runway at that point. We were crossing the Saigon River. I'm looking out at the river out there. And don't anybody tell you that the wings on the C5 are really, really bad? Because I saw the left wing go out of sight on the end of go down. I saw it go out of sight back up again, and the wing stayed on until the second impact when everything came apart. Uh, so the wings might have some defects in them, but they were pretty strong that day. And we were, we were whistling Dixie's out through there. We landed on one side of the Saigon River, fortunately, and jumped exactly the Saigon River on the other bank and killed four Viet Cong. We landed on top of them over there. And the guy in the cockpit saw us. I didn't know that so on. And that's when the airplane went into the slow motion. If you ever been in a car accident, a near accident, and everything starts slowing down for you, that's exactly what happened to me. Uh, I, my life went into slow motion. Uh, the airplane, I'm sitting, I'm going this way, and I'm looking toward after the airplane. The airplane's coming up, and in my mind, the airplane is totally together. I don't know that we've got a troop compartment one place, I've got a tail one place, I've got the cargo apartment shredding away, and I'm in the cockpit. To me, the whole C-5 is still together. And I'm thinking that. So the airplane's going up, I'm going backwards, and it's turning to my left. And about the time the tail got straight up in the air, as it's turning over, I go, you know, if this thing would just, just stop right now, I'm still alive. And then I got to think, no, no, it needs to hurry up, because I need the thing to get on the ground again, and I'll be okay, I'm alive. And it, it had to be seconds, but it seemed like five minutes that we were doing it, sliding through the ground, we were across the ground. And, and then once we got stopped, I'm hanging upside down in this cockpit in the relief area. I know exactly where I'm at. I know where everybody else is at in the airplane. I'm skinned up a little bit and bracing. Another thing, I'm standardization. You gotta uh, remove the table in case of a crash landing or water ditching. You remove the table and you store it in the closet and you turn those seats around on the other side. And as we're upside down, I'm going, I am in deep kimchi when they get to the crash site. Because <laughs> I'm in standardization, I did not remove the damn table, and I didn't turn those seats around. You know, that's the only thing going through my mind, how much trouble I'm going to be in. I just got the wing. I hadn't been there very long, and I knew my job was done probably at that point. Uh, it's crazy what, if you're potentially dying and what you're going through your stupid mind. Uh, so when I got stopped, I'm... Um, I'm listening. I, my fear in flying was always, I, I flew for 47 years between military and civilian as load master. And my fear of flying was going down in the ocean or crashing and burning up. I didn't want to do any one of those. Any other thing I could probably put up with, I didn't want that. So I'm expecting to be on fire. And when it stopped, I'm hanging upside down. I know exactly where I'm at. And I'm listening and I'm trying to smell if there's a fire. And the fire, as you saw in the picture, is one ahead of us. The wings went off of the fuel under the one head. I didn't hear the smell in that. Well, next thing I know, I see the nav there's a navigator, a load master, and a uh, flight engineer on the opposite side of me, with the table. I'm the only one at the table. They unbuckle and fall to the floor. And I thought, well, that's probably a pretty good idea, too. So I snap my seatbelt, and I fall in the floor. I further damage my concussion that's going on at this particular time. And I stand up, and in those days, the C-5 had 41 technical orders, big, big binders. They come out of that rack, and they're now in the ceiling, which is now my floor. I'm, I've done a 180 turn in the airplane. I'm going the wrong way. I'm standing in 41 tech orders. I have no idea where I'm at or where I'm at in the airplane. I can't figure it out. Plus, my concussion wasn't helping. So, and you'll see in pictures later, I tried to open that service door, and I couldn't get the damn thing to move. So I left it, and then I wound up walking out to the galley. Right where the galley goes into the environmental section, that was the end of the airplane for me, as you'll see in some pictures. But at the time, I thought, you know, that door should open. Well, if you see pictures later, it's upside down. I'm trying to go the wrong way on the door. It eventually opened later and fell. But, and then, let you talk about what, what's happening in the troop department. Okay. Um, remember in the beginning, I said we didn't have a checklist. Um, and then we couldn't communicate with anybody. So I said to the med crew that was there, okay, we've got to decide who's going to use the slide, you know, in a crash landing. And 
I said, and who's going to do what? So we started divvying up who's going to do what. When, when we finally crashed and came to a stop, because we, I don't know whether we were being naive or what, but we figured, okay, we're going we're gonna to live through this, and we've got to figure out how to take care of all these people once we come to a stop. Um, and I don't remember who, who I gave what chores to. And it's like, okay, we don't have a checklist, so we've got to play this by ear and, and make it up as we go. You know? and, and when he was talking about, when Ray was talking about the, the pilots doing this, none of us up there had any sensation of doing that because we were so busy. We went around and re-secured all the babies. We went and checked everybody. We were just so busy doing that that I never even knew it until, until they told me. And I thought, we weren't doing that. We were just going right level, but we weren't. Um, anyway, when we impacted the first time, on the one side of the side down river, the escape slides inflated in the aircraft. They popped when they inflated. So Sergeant Parker had a pocket knife in his flight suit. There's a buoy knife. He carried a buoy knife on all the time on his flight suit. Yeah. So he got up and he was slashing the slides. And he had gotten the, the one gun and then he did the second one. But when he did the second one, um, we hit, that was when we had the second impact on the other side of the river. And we had, when we had finished, we all took positions, the med crew that was up there took positions to, to sit where we could watch the babies. Um, and I ended up, you know, the, the railing, right before you go around the corner to go down the ladder, I ended up sitting there. So I was sitting on the floor facing forward so I could watch what was happening. And um, when we hit the first time, one of the med techs, got up. And one of the things we always learned in, in flight school was you don't get up till you come to a complete stop. Well, we were airborne again. And he got up. And so he started running down the aisle toward me. So when he got to me, I grabbed him and I said, get down. We're going to hit again. You need to be on the, you need to be down. You, you don't need to be up. So he, so when I pulled him down, and he was much bigger than I was, but I managed to get him on the floor to get down and stay down. When that happened, we impacted a second time. And I went sailing down the aisle all the way to the, the wall that exists between the, the flight deck and the truth department. The Frankel panel back to the bathroom. Yeah, I went straight down that way. And Sergeant Parker went too, but he was like a flying missile going through, and he actually went right through the wall. He went through the Frankel Yeah, he went right straight through it. Um, so, uh, when we stopped, I got up, and as I was going down that aisle, and as Ray was saying, you know, it, we're talking about things that, that happen in short seconds, but they seem like a long time. I'm going down there, and at that time, the, the, the airbag crews didn't wear flight suits like they do now. They were, we had like a blue utility pants, and we had a blue shirts, and we wore regular low quarters, really. So we didn't we didn't have flight suits at that time. As I'm going down the aisle banging into the to the seats, incurring injuries as I went, um, I could feel all the bones in my foot breaking. And I could feel the one shoe come off my foot. And I'm thinking, oh well, um, the shoe that didn't come off is on the foot that got broken and I'm gonna need to walk on this when we get up to take care of all these babies. So it's a good thing I didn't lose my shoe. Not, not really a logical, a logical thought, but I'm going to have to get up and take care of these babies, and I'm thinking, what am I going to do with all of them? Because we're, we're obviously not where we're supposed to be. So we come to a complete stop. We had a couple artificial holes created because of the plane coming apart. So I got up and, and actually walked through the troop compartment to see, to do a quick assessment of all of the babies. And like I said, some of them were asleep. They weren't all even awake. Some of them were fussing a little bit, but they were all in their seats. The baby that, that had the cord on her neck actually got thrown out of the loadmaster seat. She was the only baby that was in that loadmaster seat, and she was forward facing. So the impact, just even though we had secured her, double secured her, it was the impact was enough to throw her, who was probably 15 pounds, 10 pounds, throw her out of the, the seat. I actually stepped, after I did that assessment, I actually stepped out because I thought, what happened to the rest of, 
a plane and where is the flight crew and what happened? And I walked, I stepped out and pushed her in the rice paddy, so I immediately sunk up to my knees in mud and I didn't see anybody. And I thought, how are we going to get out of here and what am I going to do? And I thought, well, the two compartments, enough of a shelter, if we're going to be stuck here, we at least have something to shelter in until somebody comes and gets us. Well, I had no way to call anybody or to find anybody. And I'm, I'm looking over at the flight deck thinking, we must all be dead because I don't see anybody. And it was upside down, because I could tell it was upside down. And I thought, I don't know what happened. And then all of a sudden, from the other side, Major Wellens comes running across. He got to, to me, and I remember he, he beat the side of the truth compartment with his fist because he was so upset. And he, he just, he, he was kind of swearing at the, at the, at the plane for letting us down, literally, and, and figuratively. So he's beating the side of the plane. And then he turned around to me and he said, okay, what, what, what's happening here? And I told him, you know, we've done an assessment. And I said, now we've got to figure out how we're going to shelter them or get them out of here because we're in the middle of the rice paddy. And I don't know who's going to come get us or how they were going to get to us. It wasn't that long, although to me it seemed like it was 100 years before the helicopters started coming in. So then we organized moving the babies out from the troop compartment. But the helicopters were blowing up all the debris from the rotor wash. So in order to take the babies to the, to the helicopter, we walked backwards. So we grabbed babies and then we walked backwards to the helicopter, so we got to the helicopter. And then the guy in the back of the helicopter would tell us when to turn around and we just dropped the babies on the floor. Um, and the best line in my whole military career, and I don't have any recollection of what you're saying, but we were doing that, and I was coming back to the plane to get one, some more babies. And there was a little baby that had managed somehow to get down out of its seat and was crawling. And he crawled over the edge, and I thought, if you get in the mud, we'll never find you, because you'll just sink. So he's crawling, so I reached down, grabbed him by the seat of his pants, so I'm holding him upside down, and then I realized I couldn't stand up. Straight. So I thought, I can't, I can't stand up straight. So Major Wallace was over this way, so I walked over to him. And this is the part I don't remember, because I remember I couldn't stand up straight, and I remember starting to walk to him. And the next thing I remember was being put on a helicopter. I walked over, over to him and said, Sir, I request to be relieved of duty because my injuries prevent me from continuing and promptly fainted on top of him. Sure statement. Him. That's an actual, I heard that. And, and, and that I didn't come to until I was being put on the floor of the helicopter. Yeah, uh, I'm just trying to think here. I might want to talk about any of this. Uh, we talk about the slide inflating in the troop department. This is in April of 75. In February of 75, I was on another flight leaving Travis. It was right in front of the command post. And uh, we had a power transfer unit fire. PTU fire. And I'm up in the flight deck, administering the check rabbit young kid up there. I had 19 passengers in the back and two lo two fairly young load masters, active reservists. So we evacuate the airplane, and I go forward, you know, 30 yards here, and what the hell are we supposed to do? Then I realized nobody's coming out of the back of the airplane. So I run back into the airplane, try to walk through all this smoke and haze and stuff in the cargo compartment depleting oxygen bottles as I'm walking, you know, running out of space, I'm trying to suck on it. And I get up to the troop compartment and they cannot get the slide. The door's open, but the slide, the case won't open, won't break. And these guys, the little guys are jumping up and down on it. They had a crash axe, they're beating on it and all that. So I get in there and try to help them. And whatever happened, I don't know. We finally, the, the one slide open. We go out and I, if you never went down one of them slides with zippers on you, Flight suit, you haven't had a treat yet, so I tell you, but I was one of the last ones out. We got all 19 people out to look at it, and I left there. Well, the finding from that was in February that the safety ties holding that case together were too strong. So between February and April, they modified every damn slide in the C5 and put a weaker safety tie on that. So, what happens in Saigon on the impact at that speed? They inflate inside the airplane, case opens just like that. And that's why Parker was uh, trying to puncture this, because they were going to suffocate the babies. Now, I didn't see any of this this morning. As she said, apparently Parker flew through the air, went through the frangible panel back at the, with the uh, 
bathrooms. And his head went through, you know, there's like a square grate there. His head caught the top of one of those. And when I got to the troop compartment after they had all left, Parker was laying, body was laying on the floor, his head and thing was out into the swamp, kind of laying in the water. And you can actually see his brain at that point. But he's alive, he lived for 17 days. But I remember getting him out of the airplane and all. But there's an incident that happened, we think, flying through the air. It's my theory. But uh, remember, Parker's flying through the air, in the air, and he's got a buoy knife in his hand, okay? I didn't see the buoy knife when, when I got to the crash site. I don't know where it was at. It had been lost in the debris somewhere. But anyway, we get him out of there and get everybody out. Well, in the, in the haste of getting everybody out, first of all, the people that showed up to rescue us were South Vietnamese Air Force helicopters. And there was, I don't know how many, there were several of them. And Air America guys had closed down the shop and were getting out of the country. And they were in the club getting drunk. And they jumped right out and got in their helicopters and came to see us. And at the state of shock I was in, I still knew they were drunk. I could smell it and I knew it. And, uh, but I was glad to see it. And the guys came out there and picked us up. And, but that's the guys that came to us. And unfortunately, as we we're descending, and I don't know this, trying to get to the runway, the Vietnamese controllers are telling the crew, go around, go around, get traffic in the pattern, go around. And basically, as we got closer and put the gear down, we saw we weren't going to make it. The co-pilot, Til Captain Tilford Hark, a really, really super guy. Uh, Air Force Academy grad, uh, very smart guy, was up for BG and he got sent to strategic air command and decided he didn't like that, so he got out. But anyway, he yells to the trainer, go wings level, we're not going to make the runway. And that's what that we did. We went wings level and we're landing not even toward the runway because we can't even turn because we're losing too much altitude. And we went down in the swamp. Uh, people have run this through simulators many times. I haven't heard about it in recent years. But the speed we were going, had we made the runway, the theory is, and they figured it out, we would have still been doing 190 knots off the other end of the runway if the gear had to stay under and went through downtown Saigon. So in a sense, landing in the swamp and saw hot, soggy, it was probably a blessing in disguise for us that so many people could ride, because probably none of us would have survived. Also, had we went in the river, had flown directly across the river, which we had nothing to do with that, God was flying the airplane in, we would have drowned, I'm sure, if we went in the Saigon River. But anyway, we get it's all over now. I get out of the airplane, I walk out, and then I'm on solid, metal. I step out of the airplane, read it right where the galley ends, and I immediately went up to my, my shoulders in the swamp. And it was really weird because a lot of it was swampy, and then you'd be walking and you drag yourself out of it, and you'd be on solid ground. Solid was this. Next thing you know, you'd step in some marshy type stuff again and you go out of sight. We're trying to pick up bodies, which, and we're trying to pick up people, survivors, looking for them, pushing stuff out of the way, people. Uh, going through all that. Well, I'm listening and I hear the crying. Well, before I go over there, I get out of the, the uh, airplane and I go around and you'll see pictures in the middle of this where the control cable went through the airplane. And I look up and here's this guy in a white shirt and his blue pants and he's tangled up in the control cables underneath the cockpit area. So I go up there to check him out and it's, it's still wise. Uh, African American guy, pretty dark. And he looked white to me when I got to him. I mean, I, I think probably shock and trauma, but also he was covered in mud, hydraulic fluid, and all kinds of stuff. So when I get to him, he's got this flap of skin hanging over his, his face. So I move that skin out of the way, and his eyes start to bulge out of his eyeball. Eyeball's coming out. And being the Kentucky medic that I am, I thought, logically, why don't I just put that eye back in? So I remember taking a key with my hand and pushing the eyeball and went back in. And then I dropped the flap, and it came back down to his face again. Well, I thought he was dead. I didn't see how he could survive. He was pretty banged up. So I told him he's gonna be okay. I left him tangled up. I got out of it, but I thought he was gonna crash away, and I, I was gonna move on to other stuff. And I did that. Well, later, Captain Trainer got out of there. When he came around, and in the meantime, Wise had freed himself from those cables himself, and had crawled down, and he was in the swamp. He's kind of halfway drowning in the swamp then. So Trainer worked on him. And found a blanket and put it over it to keep him warm and said, you're going to be okay, maybe you come and get you. But 
trainer didn't think he was going to live either. Phil Wise is still alive today. He lives in Flint, Michigan. Now he's pretty banged up. He's banged up. We have people here today that have actually saw him. We've seen Phil before too. But uh, fortunately, he survived, but he got medically discharged from that. Uh, then I go to the troop department, and I'm, I'm helping her and these people get the babies out. And that's when I heard her ask for permission to be relieved of duty and things. And uh, uh, she, they get her out of there, and everybody leaves. The last two people to leave the scratch site were Captain Trainer and myself. We, were out of, we went out on an Air America helicopter. Uh, we had thought we had exhausted everything. We had found everybody that was probably alive. And, uh, and got out of there. But in the meantime, when you hear these stories about people in auto accidents and somebody, or a car falls on somebody and you have this little guy goes over and picks a car up and picks it, that can actually happen, I believe that. Because uh, that day, I was carrying adults, big adults, some of these defense attache adults, like, through that swamp, carrying two at a time, like this, and putting them on helicopters. And in reality, I couldn't pick one of them much less two, and carry them through that swamp and put them on an airplane. Now, when I got to Clark for like three days, I couldn't stand clothes on me, I couldn't stand a sheet on me, nothing. Every part of my body was overextended to the point I couldn't stand it, touching it. So I believe you can do those things. You just, your mind makes you do it. But anyway, we get out of there and we get back to head back. So let me, if you got anything else to add, is that part of it? No. Okay. Let me go through some slides here. You guys look at these, and some of them are pretty graphic, as you'll see here. Uh, and these old photos were taken by Air America helicopters. Uh, and during the time that we're out there, and also afterwards, before the dark came at night, and probably the next day, too. But you can see that debris field. Now stop back and think of those defense attache whites and those kids on that cargo floor. Now look, just see that debris field there. Advance it for me. Okay. okay, again, hold back up. No, just hold it again. Again, there's the troop compartment right here that Regina and all those 145 agents are talking. There's the cockpit. There's the backside where uh, certain wires are tangled up in the cables. There's the river we just jumped back there. Okay, go ahead. Here again is the troop compartment. There's the cockpit again. I'll go through these kind of hurry. Go ahead. Uh, again, there's the cockpit. Wings are burning up here. I don't want this debris is right out here. You can see somebody's already there. It's probably the later that day or the next morning. Now, I went out. Here's the door I was trying to open. Now it's open. It fell. It's going, I was going the wrong way with it. I went out back there in the swamp and heading toward the troop department. The flight deck guys up front, the pilots, uh, guy in the jump seat, the navigator, and the flight engineer up there. On the second impact, the ladder I had went down, came back up. On the second impact, that ladder went through the top of the airplane. It came up, went through the top of the airplane, and it blocked the entrance to the cockpit. So when all this debris is flying past me, and the table in the, where I'm sitting, I broke it off, and the crash probably broke some of it too. But it has three points holding it together. And the only point still holding that table was over against the fuselage, the most forward had to block toward me, and the, the leg had broken, and the other one, and the table flew up and hit me in the head, which was initially what started my concussion. And the breeze hitting that table, and it starts hitting my hand. And I saw a water jet go by me, uh, I, I, saw, I saw one of the uh, coffee pots go by me, and all this other stuff's coming apart. Probably some of the stuff out of the environment was going by me. And I'm thinking, it's killing the guys up front. Got to be killing those guys. Well, I didn't know the ladder down through the top block. It. All that stuff blocked. Not a piece of debris got into the cockpit area. It all got blocked at that ladder and built up down the hallway there. Um, and the crew got out, and the only person that got hurt on the way out was Captain Hart. And as he went out the window, right here, he flipped out backwards, and his foot got caught in the in the window there and sprained both ankles. And he wound up in a Vietnamese hospital, later transferred to Seventh-day Adventist Hospital, where the rest of us went. Uh, it was kind of hairy for you. And you can see some of this, you can see the swamp water right here, and see it's dry. 
these other places. Go ahead. There you go. There's the cockpit again. This is where I walked out of the behind the relief tube compartment. Bill Wise was tied up in control cables right up in here. They were still attached. Remember those ladies on the cargo floor? That's the cargo floor, guys. And this is the scavengers carrying this airplane away. You can go back to the vehicle, well, I don't can now, but we've had people go over there and visit houses in that area. And some of the troop compartment seats, they're in their house's furniture. They carry everything away from this airplane. Uh, and that's what they're doing. They're stealing right there, basically. And the children had this dollar in their thing, and we've heard stories that they were being, they were taking those bags and taking whatever they had in there, and I don't know what I was in other than a dollar. Go ahead. Again, it's the cargo floor again. There's the nose gear that came off. It's, it's very near the tail. All 24 main uh, tires and gear came off at the first impact on the other side of the river, and some people came out of it. A few out of the cargo compartment came out. Go ahead. Okay, this is what happened. Bell crank on C5, the first three locks are controlled by bell crank. The last four are controlled by bell crank, same way on the other side. Well, this is on the right, left side of the airplane looking at. The bell crank is broke right here. Anytime I've told that more than one lock in sequence on the aft ramp comes open, if you reach enough pressure and get altitude, that door is going to leave the airplane. It's more than one lock. Well, if the bell crank breaks, either three or four is going to break. So it's a, it's a disaster waiting to happen. And the tragedy in this thing was the airplane, the ramp in the graduate right from that went all the way across. That was gone from the, their back. These doors were flapping in the breeze when I initially went downstairs, but later they were gone. And the pressure door came off the wall, came down, and the problem is, got seven locks holding this side. Hold back up. Back up. Back up. Back up. We're going the wrong way or something. Back up again. Yeah. These these seven locks on this side are holding. Over here you got four locks holding. So it momentarily held that door long, the pressure door long enough when it came off. And, it, and we're talking microseconds, I'm sure. And then the pressure door went up. And that's why I cut the control cables and the two hydraulic lines in the rear of the airplane, which causes loose control. Now, in the movie, if you look at it, you'll see me standing back here on the edge of this ramp. Well, I wasn't, the ramp wasn't there. And I didn't even get, I didn't get on the ramp, actually, when I went back there. Now, this is a route of flight. We took off from Saigon, we took off. We out of the South China Sea, the rapid decompression happened right here. We get the airplane turned around, and we're heading back. And this is where we're oscillating 5,000 feet at a time for a certain period of time. And then when they put the gear down, we were trying to turn, the airplane said, I'm not going any further. It started falling out of the sky. Ironically, in 2014, Colonel Allen and one of the babies on this airplane, we went back to Vietnam. We went to this crash site uh, and saw it. We went there three times. And we'll have somebody talk about that later. But while we're there, we're standing at the actual site where the nose gear had been, and there's commercial airlining landing in Thompson, or Ho Chi Minh City, where it is now. And it made a left bank just like we did. I mean, it brought back so many memories. I mean, it's me and this one-year-old baby bonded at that particular moment, just watched that. But anyway, go ahead. Here's the first time we landed on this side of the river. This is one of the initial touchdowns over here. And we're flying along, and we lost all 24 main tires right here. Back up. Did I do that? I think you're good. Okay, yeah, there. <laughs> <laughs> and then as we're tooling along at 280 knots, still accelerating, you can see with the right wing, like a guy getting a haircut, how it's tapered in the back. Those trees, you can see they're being tapered off. That right wing is taking those trees apart. Cut them out right there. And we fly, and then the next thing out, I'm looking out, and I see water underneath. Well, I'm seeing this river. I don't know what it is. We land right here. These guys are standing on this bank watching us come at it. You imagine looking at that C5 coming at you like that? He <laughs> landed on top of them, and then the airplane starts coming apart. Go ahead. Again, that's the first side of the river. You can see the trees kind of being cut off. Go ahead. 
point, we land on the other side. I mean, you imagine we went in there, we walked around. So we hit there, then the airplane starts coming apart. The tail comes off, the tube compartment comes off, cockpit goes over here, the wings are burning up in front here. Put it. Again, that's an overview of Air America to again. Uh, T tail, tube compartment, cockpit. Now, this field is filled with not only airplane debris, but human debris too. We're, we're shredding people out here. Everybody in that cargo compartment, except we know that Phil Wise survived down there, the medic, and we know a 15 year old girl survived down there. So she was in the hospital at Clark and they had what they She was found underneath the forward ramp that did land on the back of her head. And she had what they called brain booze at that time. I'm, I'm not familiar, I don't know what that is. But she was basically a crazy person, just screaming and calling. And apparently she lived. I've never met her, I've never talked to her and all that. But, and I don't know if there's any damage or not, but she is still alive. Now there's stories circulating now, and I don't think they're true, but there's, this area was scoured over and over and over again during that day. The next day it was scoured again, rescued you. Well, about 24 to 30 hours after this crash, supposedly twins who were babies on that airplane with us in the cargo compartment were found in that, out there in that debris field. A lot. One of them is, it lives in Vietnam now. One, of the, the boy lives in the Saigon. The girl lives in the States. I don't believe the story. I don't believe that. I just I don't. I don't believe that these the twins miraculously survived that, and they spent overnight out there with everybody searching. I don't think they were planning it, but anyway, that right, you read stories. You can go on Facebook and or not maybe go on Google and see that. You talk about baby. You see those stories. And then one guy I met with Captain Trainer when he went back over there. I'm skeptical. Okay. Go ahead. Again, the debris field. Let us show you these to just give you an idea of us plowing through the mud. And again, 24 tires, and here you came over here. The nose gear came off, and it's up here to the uh, T tail. Go ahead. Again, digging through the swamp. Go ahead. Overview again. This is probably the next day with these helicopters there. Go ahead. Now, in this three, after everybody, Colonel Lowney's gone, everybody's gone, I mean, I get Parker out of the airplane. And all at once, I'm thinking, we need to get these blankets and, and pillows and things that, you know, out of here that I brought with us. So the South Vietnamese Air Force helicopter guys were in there, and I'm passing these to the, these guys to pass out the window for them to put the helicopter and take to where, I don't know where they're going, the hospital, I don't know where they're going. Passing up, and this guy was standing fairly close to me, older guy, and all at once, he grabs his firearm, he pulls it out, pulls it up against this guy's head, starts rattling in Vietnamese, something to him, and they drop everything, and they run, they run out of the airplane, and jump in their helicopter and leave. I have no idea what's going on. Well, later, Captain Trainer and I were in uh, two, Major General. Homer Smith, Army General, we're in his office talking to the MAC commander, General Carlton. And this Vietnamese guy comes in, he's a Vietnamese general, and he was hostile because his people were stealing that stuff. And he knew it. And he was going to apologize to the General Smith because his people were stealing off of us in this situation. But it, went, it all took place in front of me. I didn't know what the ruckus was about. Again, you see, this is the next thing. A lot of this airplane's gone already. It's in somebody's house. They made cooking utensils out of it, all kinds of things. Go ahead. Real high overview, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I think we repeated something. Interesting story. Been a 19 year old girl that day, some of you heard me tell this story. It's embarrassing <laughs> times. All us zipper suited flight gods were admiring this 19 year old girl. Blonde, bronze, uh, real short hair then. And she was wearing a uh, top, real loose fitting, looking up and no bra. So we're looking down, we're admiring all this. This is all going on. She gets in the airplane, 
Don't see her, don't know anything about it. We have the crash, and I'm out searching the debris field, and uh, all at once this person comes walking toward me, and the person's got a baby on her hip. This, this person was escorting a baby back to the state of Indiana that she was part of, like some, maybe Big Brother Big, but something that she was escorting this baby. Well, she had that baby, and she was carrying it towards me. And she gets up to me, and she said, I need you to do me a favor. I'm going, okay, what do you need? And she's bleeding real profusely. She said, I need you to put my ear back on for me. Well, I'd already put an eye back in, so putting an ear back on wasn't going to be a big deal. That's a piece of cake. Yeah. So she hands it to me. She's hanging on me. I take my handkerchief out, I wipe down the side of her face, and she's got an earlobe there with a gold stud in it, and the rest of her ear is cut off. Clean, clean cut. Now, we don't know, and maybe she knows, but my theory is, as Bill Parker was flying through the air in that Bowie knife, he may have cut her ear off. We don't know. It was so clean cut, you would have thought. I put the ear back in place, it was just like putting a piece of china back together. And when I went on, I wrapped my handkerchief around it, and she walked away. Okay. Never to be seen again, as far as I I got evacuated out like 24 to 30 hours later, back to Philippines. Like 24 hours after that, I'm walking down the hall in my flight suit, the only thing I still own, the one I had on. And the elevator door opens, and this person walks out of this elevator. And she says, hey! I go, get a head totally wrapped up. And she said, remember me? And I said, no. She said, you put my ear back on. Oh, I remember that. So we had a long conversation. And she says to me, I was real embarrassed in front of you that day. I said, why? So when my top got ripped off in the crash, and I was naked from the waist up. Oh, now, you guys that know me know I was in total shock. I did not see that. <laughs> 30 minutes, you know, an hour before that, I'm admiring this girl. Now she's naked in front of me, and I don't see it. I don't know. So you know that old Ray was in shelter. Okay? <laughs> Stand up. This is Susan Derby. Hi. Hi. We have not seen each other since April of 75, which was a day. She walked in. Thank you. She's just one of the special people around. Uh, you have anything to add to that one? <laughs> so, next slide. Let's go. That's that's everything again. I got some extra stuff in here. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I'm looking for some of these. Go ahead. Go ahead. Now that part that was missing out of the center of the cube, that was carried away overnight. They tore that airplane apart. You saw pictures earlier, and it's intact. That part is gone. They took it home. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Again, go ahead. Now, when we went back in 2014, this is a city. This swamp is now built up. There's houses everywhere. There's all kinds of businesses out there. Go ahead again. We need to get rid of these. Go ahead. They're not the way we're built. Again, truth, but we're uh, perfect. Uh, Phil Wise was hanging. Go ahead. Go ahead. Aaron, we scoop this up. Go ahead. Go ahead. There's the one of the engines plowing through the mud. Go ahead. There's kids and stuff piling that stuff up to carry it away. Go ahead. There's a kid carrying some part of the aircraft away. Go ahead. This is the next day. I see there's investigators out there already. And these people are still stealing red crime, carrying this stuff away. Go ahead. Uh, the guy on the left is uh, P. Bradley. He's the genius that told me to get my crash landing checklist, and I listened to him. <laughs> About Two or three years ago, some of the guys in here may know he passed. He passed away. He had a, a stroke and he passed away. Uh, this is Tech Sergeant Engel who jerked me back up onto the flight deck that day, and uh, he's a flight engineer. He's now a minister. You know, he he went to God and he got done with this. That, that's them walking into the hospital. Go ahead. Okay. Aaron, let me introduce somebody else here. Someone. Who was a one-year-old baby on that airplane with us that day is here with us today, and you're in for 
Creek. Does this actually work, or am I going to like block it? I don't know if I trust you. He, did, he was doing it right. So, um, but did you want to introduce Mary? No, not yet. So um, this was some of the reunions. Ray has gone to reunions, and I've been to a reunion before. But this is where he's met some of the adoptees. But I'll kind of go through how I met this group. So yes, I was part of Operation Baby Lifts. My name is Aaron Lockhart. Um, I this is a little bit about who I am. I grew up in, well, I was adopted out of uh, New York, and then I lived, grew up primarily in Virginia. I went to Virginia Tech, I got my undergraduate degree in communications with minors in psychology and English. I got my master's degree in business from Webster, and then I started working for the government. Uh, I was real young, so I started when I was, I wasn't even done college yet, and I started working for the government. Worked for the Department of Defense, Spent 10 years in Garmish. If you guys know where Garmish is, I get very dirty looks over that. Um, it's just jealousy, I'm okay with that. Then, as uh, a reward, I am now at Goodfellow Air Force Base in San Angelo, Texas, after 10 years in Garmish. And it's not the same. But um, the kind of really interesting part about that is I now work for the Air Force. So 20 years prior to my government career, I was always, I was kind of all over the place. I was in Albuquerque, and I was in, uh, primarily in the Northern Virginia area, then I spent 10 years in Garmish, but I had no real understanding about the Air Force. Then, if, if the universe is, is supposed to be telling me something, I now work for the Air Force. For the last three years, I worked for the Air Force. I worked just like you guys as a civilian. I worked in public affairs, Alec Goodfellow, and I've learned more and understand so much more about the Air Force culture, about what you get, who your guys is rank, and their story too. So their story became a lot more clear for me as I've now become a part of the Air Force family as well. In addition to that, I don't like to be bored, so I went ahead and started a couple businesses. I used to have an antique shop when I was in Germany, and then I started two companies, uh, or two, well, another company that was a part of Strongman World, and I'll explain some of that. It's kind of a weird little thing that I got into, um, but I'm not doing it anymore, but it's kind of weird because it actually links to my whole entire story. So I, I do photography as well. So I actually went around and did some photography here in Tacoma. It's a pretty nice town. I really like it. But this is, the reason I talk about this is this is how I use my way to express and get and sort of uh, process my own story. So when we went back to Vietnam, I used my photography, I write. Um, so for whatever reason or for whatever purpose, I have been fortunate enough to get these gifts and as a result have continued to tell the story. And usually it's with Ray or it's with Regina or it's all of us. And like I said, this is a super big treat for us because it's only the second time that we've all presented together. So when the strongman world is kind of a, a weird little niche, you guys might have some awareness about it, but I got into it when I was in Europe and I ended up traveling all over the world and I would do photography and I was kind of in the right place at the right time and I was hanging out with these beasts. And it was a lot of fun, and it was a really neat experience. It got published quite a few times, but it was just the, these guys are amazing. They're, they're just ridiculous. But I, I did a little bit of that for a while, and that was pretty crazy and fun. Um, I actually competed myself. That's me pulling that truck. Um, Sejonis Invictus is one of the strongest men in the world. So I, I really, and there's uh, Bjorn Thorne uh, from the Game of Thrones, the mountain. We got to hang out with him quite a bit. So I had, I've had a really unique experience when I was overseas, and I thought it was kind of cool to share part of this, uh, this part of the story, and it kind of comes together later on as well. So that's me when I was a baby, and I was born in Bin Long, and those are the nuns that took care of me um, while I was there. And the one on the left is Sister Ursula, who died on a plane crash. She is the one who chose me for my parents. The one on the right is Sister Fidelma, and she was also part of what was actually a compound in Bin Long at that time, and their whole purpose was to get women off the street, give them a profession, and try to, to keep them from becoming prostitutes or you know kind of going down a, a bad path. So they were a, an order that started in France, but most of these nuns were from Ireland. So they had traveled all that way and this was their life's work. And of course, uh, the crashing obviously, we've, we've gotten quite a bit of background on that. So this is, this is my Lockhart family. This is my actual last name. That's my sister who was also adopted from Vietnam, but we're not blood sisters. So I am the youngest of four. My two older brothers were natural to my parents, and then my sister was adopted, and I was the last one to come out. 
And so in 1997, which seems like a lifetime ago, uh, I met Regina Alney. And the way that that happened is I graduated from, I graduated from college and I was trying to figure out what I was gonna do with my life and I always loved to write. And I thought, you know what? Maybe this is a really good time. I just finished my undergraduate degree. I was trying to decide if I was gonna do my master's. So I started doing some research and this is the early, early days of the internet. And lo and behold, I put in, you know, Operation Baby Lips in an article about Regina Aoni came up that um, was in, oh, it's like Therabin Therabin Magazine. So I tracked down the author and tried to get in contact with her because there's two sides to the story. There's the Air Force side, but then there's also a lot of the folks that were on the ground. There were the, the nuns and the orphanages and the organizations like Friends for All Children. And Friends for All Children, there was one of seven organizations that were on the ground helping to facilitate getting us out. So, um, but the military side was a lot easier. So I knew that I could track down names and try to find some information that way. So that's how it all started. So I found her through, um, through various channels and we kept missing each other. In fact, I don't know if you wanna help tell a little bit of the story. I was, I had been in DC. I had been, I had been teaching at the Uniformed Services University and I was also part of the Toy Service Nursing Research Group, which kept me going PDY a lot, even though I was at that time the medical operations squadron commander down in Charleston. And I kept getting this message on my phone, <laughs> and it was this voice that would say, hello, Colonel Lani, this is Erin Lockhart. I would like to talk to you. And that was all she said. And I thought, who in the world is this person? I have no idea who she is. And to backtrack a little, I actually did teach at, the, at flight school. I was a flight nurse instructor for four years down in Brooks. And I used to do a, a three hour lecture on the C5 and, and gear it to the nursing and the med tech so that they could anticipate as much as possible things that can happen in, in air medical evacuation. Um, one of the questions they always asked me, because I always gave me time to ask questions was, do you know any of the babies? And I said, no. I said, and there's no way for me to find them because when we brought them, they all had Vietnamese names, and they're all going to American families, and so their names were all changed, and there was no possible way. We had no contact with the parents, no possible way for us to find the babies. So then I'm in Charleston in 97, and it was the week before Christmas, I was writing an OPR. It's one of those times you remember, and I hated writing OPRs, but I was writing like this. And the phone rang again, and I picked it up, and the voice that had been on the other emails, I mean, voicemail said, Hello, Colonel Lowney, this is Aaron Lockhart. I'm one of the babies from the C5 Operation Baby Lift mission. I wanted to call you up and say thank you. I could not talk. I was so overwhelmed because I never in my wildest dreams thought I would ever meet any of them. Well, it just so happened I was going to be going to EY to DC, which is where she was living, the next month. And I said, well, let's arrange to meet. So we met at the um, Navy, um, at the quarters for the Navy out by Bethesda, because I was there and I had, and we were going to meet. And so I had called this one restaurant that the faculty like to use for special occasions. So I called and made reservations for the for the dinner that night. So I was waiting for her at the, at the Navy Q, and she came in, and that was when we met. So it was 1997, and um, I think we hit it off really right away. Yeah, so the, what I like to tell about this story, so this is 22 years in the making, which is kind of hard to imagine, but it is the fact. So we built this relationship, but we built it slowly. So it wasn't like, you know, immediately as soon as we got to know each other, that there, you know, it was rainbows and butterflies and all that type of thing. It was a real relationship. We built it. We worked at it. And that's how it came to be what it is now. So, ostensibly, I am a part of her family. She is a part of my family. And we are um, all this, this package, and it's all a result of, of a very tragic event that happened, but brought some amazing things in, in the end. So, this, as I said, I'm family. Um, this, is, uh, this is Regina with her daughters. And, um, and I got in on the family picture too because she, we are family. Um, I'm extremely close to the middle daughter, but I'm also close to the others. They accepted me open arms. There's never any kind of 
Tension, well, that's not true. Diana kind of gave me crap when I first came into the family. <laughs> we fight all the time, but they're the best of friends. Yes, yeah, so the straight out tells me, what do you want and why are you here? So I was like, oh, okay, this is, this is awkward. But um, she's now, you know, dear and very much my sister, and we, uh, we're, we're super, super close. And, and, but it's, it's taken time, and like I said, all relationships took work, but this is, this is kind of ultimately where we got to be. And then in 2014, I took this wild, crazy crowd, and we went to Vietnam. And um, while we're raised there, everybody knows that's the party. So um, we set off, and we decided it was a, we knew that we wanted to write about this. Um, Regina and I developed this relationship, and we thought, this is a story that needs to be told. And we tell that story, because it, we feel like it has value, and we feel like people can benefit from the story every time we tell it. It's a little bit different. So, so we set off for Vietnam. And this is, on the right is where, what it looks like, well, it looked like five years ago. That's kind of crazy, it's been almost five years. Um, but that's the same, same rice field, same field where the crash occurred. And we had, we had missions. I mean, we had a purpose to go there. We were going to honor those of whom we lost. We were there to pay our respects. I was there to learn a little bit about a country that I didn't know anything about. And it was, it was intense, and it was a beautiful experience, but one that we felt like we all needed to do together. We even set out to visit other orphanages. This was probably the most gut-wrenching experience of my life because I knew and recognized that had it not been for Operation Baby Lift, that I would be sleeping on a bed that doesn't have a mattress and that I would be a part of these kids in their lives. And it was, it was I felt like I kind of tortured myself in that process, but it was also very rewarding because in the end, what I realized, even in these, even in these homes, that they still experienced love, and they still had people that were taking care of them, and they still had people that mattered to them. And those, that was the foundation that launched me to get to where I'm standing before you now. So Ray, doing Ray's thing, if he's not flirting, we don't, he, he, there's something wrong, he's probably dead. Um, so he was, he was completely doing his flirtation thing, and we had a great time, and we, we, we really interacted with these kids. And we walked away kind of knowing that, again, this is a part of, this is a part of my story. I felt like this was a part of um, where, where, this, where we all came, where I came from. And then we, we made a point to, to honor. And that was really important for our, our mission to go back there. We ended up finding, if I, if I told you all the weird coincidences that happened while we were over in Vietnam, you probably wouldn't believe me, but there's a lot of random things that happened. And one of them was that we were in the wrong place, or we thought we were in the wrong place, come to find the shrine, because we were looking to get back to where that field was. But instead, I'm on the phone with my interpreter, and she, she didn't come with us on that particular day, and then we end up stumbling upon the shrine. Well, and the shrine is, is, on the bottom part of it, is part of the shrapnel from the plane. And so this is where a lot of um, orphans like myself We'll come back and we and pilgrimage here and we pay our respects, leave something, and we felt like people need to understand what this was. There's nothing in there. It's just this is just like knowledge amongst the locals. So me being me and us being us, I was like, you know what? It needs something. You know, people need to know why this is here. So we set up a little plaque or just, just with the help of uh, my interpreter, we set up something that just let people know why this little shrine was there. We put it, had it translated into Vietnamese and it's still there, so that's kind of cool. So that was us at the, uh, again, at the shrine. We went back a couple times, um, again, the, it, and it was fortunate because we went in November, so that was um, uh, Veterans, Day. Veterans Day. So we visited on Veterans Day, again, all, <laughs> the whole point to, to honor. So this has been long, this is that compound I was telling you about. Um, we went down and visited there, so I got to see where I was, where I was born, but now, it's uh, a government building um, that you're not really not allowed to take pictures of. I, I did anyway, so um, <laughs> I got lucky. I, I'm still not in Vietnam, so <laughs> they didn't put me in jail. But they were really adamant. We couldn't get into that compound. What we learned, and again, serendipity, the serendipitous situation, there are these people that were literally across the street. They knew about uh, the Vin Long compound. And she, this woman, with, through my interpreter, told us all about it and how they ended up decimating that whole area, because I think it had been used by the Vietnamese army at one point, decimating that whole area and took down all the buildings because the, the North Vietnamese government was so angry 
that the nuns were helping the Americans. And so that's, so that just tore everything down and then they, they recreated this uh, government building. So while we were in Vietnam, this is where the strongman story comes into play. So as I was going and, and traveling throughout the, the country or throughout the world, the finals for a strongman competition were happening in Malaysia. So the organizer was trying to convince me to go and pop over to Malaysia since I was in Vietnam already. And I was like, um, kind of doing this life thing. So, but I'd been working really hard to build up the company. I felt like this was an opportunity. It was a real quick little flight. So I left, I left mom and Ray in Vietnam and was like, all right, we're gonna go over to Malaysia just for a couple days and we're gonna do this thing and I'm gonna, I'll shoot, shoot it and we'll, we'll go. Well, there's a book that um, the nuns wrote. So the Air Force keeps really good records. I think the nuns keep better records. Um, there's a, a book that they wrote that gives me a little bit of history about the Bin Long uh, compound, which is really cool. Well, they also talk about Sister Ursula, and Sister Ursula has always been a very important piece of my puzzle. So, because she was the one person that has always been a figure in my life. I had the picture of Sister Vidalma and Sister Ursula on my, on my desk as a kid growing up, and it was always there. Then, so, mom's reading this book when we're in Germany, getting ready to go to Vietnam, and she's like, okay, so where, do you know where Sister Ursula was from? I was like, I don't know, for some reason I think it was the Philippines. She said, no, it's actually Malaysia. I'm like, oh, that's cool. I'm like, I bet you it's probably really far from where I'm gonna be. Nope, try 10 miles away. So by complete accident, I end up on the other side of the world, popping over to Malaysia, and then going to send a note to the diocese of, um, in Malaysia, got a response back from the nephew through marriage of Sister Ursula. This part is always the really hardest part for me. So, I get to go to Malaysia and pay my respects to the woman that is the direct reason that I get to stand here. She chose me for my parents. She sacrificed her life so that I can have this one. And when I stood before her grave, I was like, I wonder how I'm gonna feel. You know, this person is just, why, why was this such an emotional thing for me? And I realized because this is my first mother figure. This is the first person that took care of me. This is the, if without her nurturing, I wouldn't have been set on the path that brought me to this place. So when I saw the date um, on the gravestone and I stood before the grave, and I was by myself, so at the time my now ex-husband wasn't with me, they were in Vietnam, and I was just on my own. So I met their family and I stood before their grave and in front of complete and utter strangers, I lost it, completely lost it. It was nothing but tears from like beginning to end. And I couldn't, I just wanted to understand what it was about. And bottom line is, it was about people making choices. It was about a person and a nun who sacrificed her life and made a choice so that I could have this life. And then there's and then there's this endless amount of things that have happened. So I'm gonna run through a couple of these real quick, but you might recognize somebody up in there. But um, when I was, I did a, an interview with NPR and, um, um, and so we, that was just a huge, amazing experience while I was in Germany and we met while I'm there, I get a phone call from Kathy because she called Ray. So of course, again, it's Ray's party, we just show up. Um, so she calls Ray, Ray calls me and says, hey, so there's this woman, Kathy Disney, who's um, in over Amargau right now, and she's telling me that she met another Operation Baby Loved adoptee. Like, you got to be kidding me. Completely true. And what was kind of interesting is his English wasn't great, and I just actually got a text from him recently. So we ended up speaking primarily in German. My German's horrible, but we still, we made it work. But I thought, how in the world is this happening? I did the interview in Munich with um, NPR. Next thing I know, I'm in Upper Amargau, and I'm meeting another adoptee, and I've now been introduced, and that was my first introduction to the Lone Masters world. <laughs> so then I was on a mission. Okay, after we went, came from Vietnam, after we, uh, we worked on the book, I was on a mission because I realized that it, it is, people make choices. Now it was my turn to make choices. So I went and I started finding people. And I went and found a couple more nuns that took more infant long, and, I, and they were super skeptical of me. Like, what do you want and why are you here? And I'm like, I've heard this before. So I reassured them, I am here with the one and sole purpose to say thank you. Because you all made a choice. And so from that choice, this is who I this is who I am, and you need to know who and what I am. So then I went to Taiwan and I went and found Sister Fidelma to do the exact same thing. 
So I traversed the whole entire world with the sole purpose of trying to find and let people know that their work, their mission, what they were doing, it was not lost on me. And on top of that, so right where my where Bin Long was, I'll run through these really quick, but in, in Bin Long, I ended up, there was a, an army airfield, helicopter guys. And usually when I do these presentations, I wear a cap hat, which is like one of my greatest honors. And this group, they, they used to help take care of the nuns, and they would come over and play with the, the, the kids and the orphans. And so I had the, the honor of meeting them, and it's hung out their reunion. They made me an honorary member, and then I get to wear the cap hat. So it's a huge, prideful moment for me, and I, these, these folks are real special to me, so that was a really ex exciting experience. Um, they had another reunion, I get invited to their reunions at another reunion in Nashville, so off I went to Nashville. Um, we've done talks in San Antonio. This was a POW, these were spouses of POWs, and there's something unbelievably powerful about doing a presentation amongst people that or POWs, or their wives that were sitting at home waiting for their, their husbands to come home. Um, and Lee Ellis, he's, he also does a lot of talks. He's, he's a, a POW, and he, gave, he read the book and, and loved it and had just a great recommendation, and so we put him on the cover. But it was an honor. It was a really amazing honor to be able to meet and, and talk with him. Um, so, again, the, the things that happen and why the story matters and how it keeps continuing to matter, it's a long story, but basically I got a Facebook message from somebody who said that they had a medal and it had Mike Padgett's name on it. And they asked me if I knew who it was. Through a Google, Google search, it came up. And I was like, yeah, I know exactly who that guy is. And she said, well, somehow I ended up with this medal and we want to get it to the right place. So, another mission. So, Mom and I set off. We went to Colorado Springs, got in the car. This is his brother, and we did not tell him why we were there. We were just like, hey, we're happy to be in the area. We'd love to meet up with you. And I returned that medal to his brother. And it was, uh, it was an honor, and it was, a, it was really special, and I think it was special for him to let, and again, it's not just the, uh, it, it's I want the family members to know that I didn't forget. I didn't forget, I know why I'm here. And then, we, we are always on tour. So we were in Dayton. Um, that, was, that was a lot of fun, the technical airlift. Uh, I can't, I, I've lost track of how many bottles of moonshine I drank with Ray. Um, <laughs> I know everyone's upset that's not here, so including me. So, <laughs> but it's probably better in the long run. So, and this was, this is the book that, that, uh, that we wrote. And it's, it was a way for us to process and to experience everything that we have been through. Um, and it was, it, it, primarily it's the story between Regina and I and how we came to be where we are. But really, so the whole point and the reason why I'm trying to be as quick about this as possible is I want you all to realize that it, it matters. You matter. Um, this opportunity, this situation, how this all came to be, this is a unique scenario. It's a full circle and that's why it's a story that can continue to resonate. But when I, when I come and do these things, now that I work for the Air Force, I really get it. I thought I got it before, now I really get it. Each one of you is doing something that matters. Each one of you might have this opportunity one day to have a full circle opportunity to do something for someone and make a decision that matters. And so there is never gonna be a day where I'm not going to live my life recognizing that I need to give back because people made choices for me and now it's my turn to make choices. And with that, I'm paying it forward. So I am now the uh, foster to adopt mom of three young girls. And that is all new that has happened. And of all the things that I went through that I have done, this is by far the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. <laughs> Holy crazy, and I'm doing it alone. So it hasn't always been easy. I'm, yes, I'm divorced. I've, I've had my fair share of life, as the rest of us have. But never am I forgetting that with gratitude and giving back, that's how we move forward. So these are my girls, um, they make me crazy, and I, I want them to experience and know this story, be a part of it, and I want to continue and build their story so that they have an opportunity to have as many opportunities as I do. So, that's my show. <laughs> Now you've heard that story, so let's get some other people up here. There's another baby who's somewhere between three and five years old at the time of this crash, and she remembers the crash. 
She lives in California, and she's here with us today. Carrie, come up here, please. Come up, come up on stage. I want questions. Come on. <laughs> Here's an opportunity to picture you guys that you'll never get again. <laughs> um, Carrie, uh, we, we get together you know, two, three, four times a year, and uh, she's living a great life. She's, we'll get some pictures later. <laughs> <laughs> she's living a great life, but we, we all this together. And just give me a little side story on Carrie. Carrie came from the pits of, you saw all this, she remembers it. She can talk to you about what was going on that day. She remembers the flash fire and the oxygen, all those things. And we got this together in 2013 when I first met her at a reunion. And uh, she said, uh, I was in that crash with you. And I said, okay, and we talked a little bit. She said, I was somewhere around five years old. I go, time out, you weren't five years old. You couldn't be. She said, why? I said, because if you were five years old, Colonel Lowney and I would have put you downstairs in the car compartment and you wouldn't be standing here talking to me now. There's no way that we put you upstairs. And we did. We don't know to this day how this happened. But she survived because we put her up there for some reason. Now she was very petite. She still is. But she's very small. And I think she was malnourished and maybe sick. But I've seen pictures of her after that. Good Lord, Rand. <laughs> but I've seen pictures of her right after she got back to the States. And uh, uh, she, she looked too large for us to put up there. But anyway, that happened. And then she went from the depths of Vietnam and a bad scene to living in Los Angeles in the Hollywood area. So she may have stories on that, but I just well, I wanted to recognize her here also. She won't get up and talk, but she will answer questions. So if there's any questions now, we'll pass this mic around and let people be able to, you can ask anybody. Any questions? No questions? What do you remember? What's that? What's something that you remember? Of the crash? Yeah. Oh, so. Okay, I don't speak, I don't like speaking. It makes me want to pee up here, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you asking me or? Yeah. Oh, I literally remember pretty much everything. I remember um, being taken away and being put on the plane and in a seat immediately and crowded with a bunch of babies and I couldn't figure out why and then the seatbelt immediately put over me. And I was just telling them that my whole focus as I was going down and remembering going down or the deceleration, that trying to take the seatbelt off all the time. Like just that was my whole goal and luckily the seatbelt never came off. And then when I met Ray, I remembered like the mask came down on one side of the plane. So we kind of figured out where I was um, sitting and that they weren't working. Like they were being pulled, but pulled completely off. So they weren't, you know, over people's heads. And then, um, I remember being taken off and just being in like rice mat and putty, rice putty, rice patty and mud. And just like he was talking, it was like wet and dry, and then it was, you know, <coughs> sticky. And and then the next thing I knew, I was like in a very sterile hospital. I couldn't, I didn't know what hospital they went to. It was just white room and very, um, you know, like steel table. And just and then. I, I remember a helicopter, but I don't know if I was taken off on a helicopter. So as I, because I can remember that big helicopter. And again, until I had met Ray, I thought this was, you know, my parents were white that adopted me. So originally my parents were supposed to adopt another girl that was on the plane. And they had all her paperwork and they had her name picked out. And she, um, so from what I understood, all the people who were on the top were either men, I told them were handicapped babies or people who couldn't take care of themselves. And the girl that my parents were supposed to adopt was 18 months old and she was, she had some kind of, she was half blind or half something. So she should have been on the top. Somehow she was on the bottom. I was on the top and she perished. So when they found out she had died, they asked him, you know, if you want another child. So I did. So when I had talked to Ray, I said, you know, I don't know why I was on the top, but I need to put me on the top. And then I was telling the story of, you know, what I remembered, and I always thought, am I just dreaming it? Am I watching Platoon and thinking that's what it was? Like, you know, as you're growing up, all the Vietnam movies were coming out, and they were very disturbing. I could never fully watch them all, but um, I just never knew if it was something someone was, I mean, my parents didn't know. They were white, so they weren't there. They weren't told really the story. I mean, we went to court. I, I had to um, 
testify because I was the only one who survived and remembered. So when I met him and Regina and Bud Trainer, it was just such a great confirmation that you know I was dreaming it and it was it's true. And you know, I grew up, people were like, You're not, you know, sorry. The Asians were like, You're not Vietnamese, the whites were like, You're not really white, so you just, you know. Now we're so multicultural, but back then you were definitely, I don't know how you felt, like you felt like, a, you know, I'm dark, a little darker skin. I mean, I look, compared to what I looked like, I looked very Asian. Like you might have a picture, I looked very Asian, and then you know, you get Americanized. Um, but it was very difficult, and I never talked about it. I didn't want people to know I was Asian. I didn't want people to know what I was. I always said I was Greek or Spanish. I learned Spanish just so I could, you know, I mean, I still can understand some Vietnamese, but. It was it was very difficult growing up and remembering it. I didn't want to remember it, but I wanted to remember it because I kept having the flashes. I kept thinking about it, and every time I got in the car, you know, the seatbelt was such always still an issue to me. My mom always had the seatbelt tied because you know you had cheesy seatbelts. Because I was in the middle, because I was little. Um, but it was just really. Um, it, as I got older, I started appreciating, you know, where I came from and what. You know, people did, and when I met Ray, it was really just like, God, I have to get more involved. I need to get out there. I'm trying to find my biological family. I did. I found my biological dad, who served in the war, which when he died. Um, it was just, it, that was a full circle. I met him, his, or not him, his family, and they've embraced me. And I've learned new things. I'm actually a year younger than I am, so that's great. <laughs> um, so, you know, my husband's not happy because that means he has to celebrate two birthdays. So, um, but um, just like Aaron was saying, like you, you want to give back, and I, I do want to say, I think I didn't get to talk well last time we had this, and what, you know, I know the routine of what you guys do daily, and the daily things of it. And, God, we have to do this, keep practicing that. But it, like he said, it's just routine. It comes, it comes, and you just do it, and it, it can save a life and save ours. I mean, I, I think if it wasn't for Bud and what you guys did, like. Who knows what we, where we would have been? I don't know. You know, we're in the rice paddy, I guess. I don't know. You know. So, yeah, that's, I remember it all, <laughs> good or bad. I mean, now I don't want to forget about it, you know? And now, like, I have two children, and I wish they looked more Asian. Like, I'm so anti all that. And now I wish, you know, I wasn't, and I embraced it earlier. But now I am, so there I am. <laughs> and I did pee. <laughs> I'd like to say something about Susan, too. Uh, we have not seen each other since we've been in the hospital at Clark, and I left while well, she was still there until today at 2.30, and she walked in here. Uh, she is now a nurse here in the uh, Seattle, Tacoma area, uh, and I'll let her talk a little bit about that, about why she is a nurse and what happened there. Well, I was at, at Clark for months, and I was, at, I was at Clark Air Force Base for months, using it like a hotel. I had the big bandage on my head, and someone would show up and give me a helmet, and I'd jump on the motorcycle, and we'd go off swimming, and I'd come back and just uh, hang out at the hospital. And the nurses would ask me to help take people to x-ray, or to sit, and there was one person that was uh, from Vietnam, actually, but he was brought over, he was hurt in combat, and uh, the, he was not supposed to go to sleep. They thought if he lost consciousness that he might slip away. So they we take stages sitting at the side of his bed and trying to keep him from uh, passing out. So I loved it, and I think that the crash made me a nurse. And I lost my fear of people in that plane crash. It's just and she still has half an ear that I put back on. That's right. <laughs> the uh, plastic surgeon that just happened to be in Vietnam at the time took my ear and said, you're one of the few people that's ever seen the back of your, her ear and the front of her face. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anybody have any questions for any of them up here? Well, Susan, the, uh, the little baby you were here in, whatever happened. Yeah. Well, 
he survived, and he was flown out. He was flown out almost immediately to, uh, I think, Travis Air Force Base, and he was adopted into a family in Indiana, and now he's driving a UPS uh, truck in Florida. They changed his name to Jeffrey from Benoit, and when they they had no idea he was in the plane crash, so uh, they gave him a, his middle name Dang. Vietnamese is bravery for brain. Anyone else? Brandy, I'm up here. Hey, Chief. Yes. Uh, Son Galeotto from uh, Stewart, New York. Uh, you said that uh, the original WAG was for about 1,200 people in the C5, and uh, <laughs> ultimately, I think, was around 330 that were on the airplane. Yes. Um, what happened between those two numbers, I don't know. You know my, my count wasn't accurate. I, mean, I, I guarantee that. I don't think that count is accurate either because there's no manifest. The only manifest that existed from that crash was in my pocket. And when they asked for the manifest after the crash, I said, I got it. And I, I was in the hospital and I handed it to them. And it was only the defense attache office wives, the women that were on that plane. Nobody else has meant it. The rest of the manifest will be in the store, in the cargo compartment, and all that's gone. So there are no records. And Chief, when you button up that aircraft, do you think 1,200 was a good wag for the C-5? Yes. I still, well, I, yeah, I believe that. But again, that's, as we call it, a wag, right? <laughs> uh, it's it a bad day in Blackrock, but it, it turned out in the end, when you see these success stories, it turned out to be somewhat okay. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what else to say on it. I just, uh, I'm, I'm glad to be able to present it to you. We talk all over the country on this and we try to keep it alive. And if you watch TV on 4 April of every year, every national network will have Operation Baby. That they'll, make, they'll make note of it. And I think, to me, the only reason they do that, but that's still a story, is these kids get out and they're, they're all over the place. I know probably 15 or 20, I know probably 35 or 40, and I'm kind of close friends with about 10 of them. And one of them lives right here in the Seattle area. And I'm not friends with her, but Erin is. We tried to get her here today, but she hasn't responded back. But they talk about it. They have reunions, they, you see them on TV, and I think they keep that story going and going. And so many of these people, believe it or not, you know, all walks of life has a few people that don't turn out well. So many of these people are successful, very successful. We've got a few that we know about that, that aren't, but we all have friends we know that didn't turn out as well as they could have. So I think that just keeps this whole story alive. It, it is still as interesting today. People want to hear about it. And the other reason we try to keep telling it, there's many of you in here today, these young people, you've never heard of Operation Baby, that's probably. So we try to keep that thing going just because of that and the organizations we talk to around the country try to keep that alive. But I present some really nice people to you here today. Okay, thank you. <laughs>